Welcome everyone, Zena. We wish, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this, miss, uh, this meeting place is a still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Welcome to our event today on digital disinformation and right-wing extremism. Before we begin, I want to express our appreciation to the Institute of Islamic Studies at the University of Toronto, the Center on Hate, Bias and Extremism at Ontario Tech University, and the Intersectionality Research Hub at Concordia University for initiating and co-organizing this webinar series. I also want to thank the Algorithmic Media Observatory at Concordia University, the InfoScape Lab at Ryerson University, the Disinformation Project at Simon Fraser University, and Canadian Heritage Digital Citizen Contribution Program for supporting this series. A special thanks to the folks at the Institute of Islamic Studies, including Professor Amar Iman, Zaid Khan, and Nisa Rahman, among others who help us with the logistics and technical issues. Today, we begin with the first of the three webinars in our series on transnational right in extremism and digital disinformation. It has been said that information is power, but the, in the current era of post-truth, we might more accurately say that disinformation is power. In recent years, we have witnessed an unprecedented rise in the high in the right wing right in the in the right wing extremist movement, political parties, and other political actors who have exploited the structural features of social media platforms. This has caused a shift in what internet scholar Jesse Daniel has aptly described as the overturn window. That is a transformation that has authorized previously unacceptable discourse to become tolerated and even defensible in political and public conversations. Thus, this webinar series focuses on how such previously unacceptable and hate filled rhetoric has pushed its ways into mainstream discourse and how right wing extremists around the world employ and exploit the affordance of social media platforms to advance such worldview, expanding the overturn window further and further. The accessibility and structural features of various social networking sites have resulted in the amplification of misinformation and disinformation on and offline. Taking advantage of these features, far right groups have carefully and purposefully concocted campaigns of disinformation and, pu and persuasion. From Pizzagate to QAnon, from the Great Replacement to Coronavirus Conspiracy Theories, millions of people around the globe are negatively affected by the virulent mis- and disinformation produced on digital media platforms. These disinformation campaigns orchestrated by forward actors, both nationally and internationally, have led to the unprecedented rise in Islamophobia, xenophobia, misogyny, and anti-Semitism, among other venomous and hateful sentiments. Digital disinformation not only helped spread baseless phobias and hatred of people of color, Muslims, and other marginalized groups, it also creates and legitimizes conspiracy theories, such as the threat of the population and vaccine as hoax. Such phobias and conspiracies are evident in the baseless narrative associated with the recent Freedom Convoy, a protest movement which began as an outcry against mandatory vaccinations and other public health measures. What has become evident throughout the Convoy's Occupy Ottawa movement is that sympathizers came to believe that vaccinations are, at the very least, oppressive and at worst are intentionally designed to kill people en masse. Research conducted by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue and others demonstrate that the Freedom Convoy movement is being supported at home and abroad across various right-wing extremist groups, including the Proud Boys, the Proud Boys, the White Nationalist Stormfront, 
and white lives matter. In addition, writing media content creators such as Ben Shapiro and Gillen Beck have supported the convoys. According to Beck, the ways in which the government of Canada suppressed the convoys is an example of what he refers to as the Great Reset, a master plan conceived of by government and elites around the globe to, to reset the global economy using banks, government programs, and environmental, social, and other governance metrics. If they succeed in accomplishing the Great Reset, Beck argues that international corporations, institutions, and governments and governmental officials will be able to consolidate their powers toward, from Beck's per perspective, absolute global domination. In addition, far-right supporters of the freedom convoys is not limited to digital advocacy and their presence at rallies but also through direct fundings. For instance, the Anti-Defamation Leaks has identified that 1,100 people who donated money to the January 6th insurrection at the US Capitol are the very same individual that donated to Canada's Freedom Convoy protests. Today, our panelists will discuss these critical nexus and the mutually reinforcing mechanics of extremism and disinformation represented by this example. With horrifying precision and unrelenting progress, right-wing extremism has proliferated on the internet over the past two decades. However, the pace and magnitude at which this extremism and hate has seeped into the psyche of the global population can be attributed to the ease of dissemination of disinformation on social media platforms, facilitated by feature of anonymity, speed, shareability, and virality. The Institute, of, uh, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue has identified over 6,000 right-wing extremist channels, page, groups, and accounts across different social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Fortran, and Go, and Gab, and, and, among others. While diverse in their origins, right-wing extremists active online advanced related ideologies. For example, overlapping, uh, overlapping aims include the advancement of white supremacy, Islamophobia, ethno-nationalism, male supremacy, and anti-government extremism, among others. These social networking sites have become right-wing extremist war room to plan and coordinate events recruit members, finance activities, and communicate. In addition to these practical purposes, extremists exploit social and digital media sites to sow disinformation, both as a weapon to attack their opponents and as a means to manipulate their sympathizer and ever-widening ever global audiences. Indeed, the toxic influence of this information about writing extremist group is not just a Western phenomenon. One prominent example is India. With the population over a billion people, India is the largest democracy in the world and a hotbed of Hindu nationalism. Motivated by dogma, very similar to any far-right extremist ideology, Hindu nationalism is the leading political ethos in India owing much to his populist and Trump-loving Prime Minister, Narendra Modi. Research shows that the Prime Minister's official and personal Twitter accounts follow, um, follow some of the most hardcore Hindu nationalist extremist actors. For example, my own research demonstrates how these ultra-nationalist groups and individual actors disseminated deceptive and misleading information across social media during the Indian election campaign. By disseminating disinformation and hate towards Muslims, these online groups and individuals helped to polarize the Hindu majority vote, thus handing Modi the premiership in India. Therefore, in the wake of rising populist and political extremism and growing entanglement between disinformation and right-wing extremist groups, today's webinar focuses on the definitions, drivers, content, and consequence of digital disinformation. Our panelists will examine the role of algorithms, artificial intelligence, 
and other system level factors that enable the flow of right wing extremist disinformation across mainstream and, uh, and fringe online platforms. In the recent manifestation and aftermath of the Freedom Convoy, these panels and our discussion together are clearly timely and crucial. On that note, I will give the floor to Professor Giovanni, who will moderate the panel. Dr. Yasmin Giovanni is a full professor in the Department of Communication Studies and a Concordia University Research Chair in Intersectionality, Violence and Resistance. She is the author of Discourse of Denial, Race, Gender and Violence, and co-editor of Girlhood, Redefining the Limits and Faces of Violence in the Lives of Girls. Over to you, Professor Giovanni. Thanks so much, Zainab, uh, and thank you for that introduction. I'd like to welcome everyone again to this uh, amazing webinar, the first in the series. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you the webinar uh, panelists. But I will say at the outset that I'm not going to describe them in much detail because all of them <clears throat> have really, <coughs> excuse me, lengthy and robust CVs which if I were to summarize, would probably take up all of our time. So I'm keen as much as you all are on hearing uh, our panelists. So we will start in the order of uh, Professor Al-Ravi, who is an associate professor in um, news, social media and public communication at the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University. And he also is uh, the director or runs the disinformation project. He's the author of at least five monographs that I know, uh, not including so many others that are co-edited, and has also done work on YouTube and cyber wars in the Middle East. And he's a prolific um, a writer and author and also a media personality. So we will start with Ahmed and thereafter, we will be the, he will be followed by Professor Megan Bowler, who is a full professor in the Department of uh, Social Justice education at the Ontario Institute for Education, for Studies in Education, University of Toronto, OISE for short. Um, she also has authored and edited numerous works, including more recently, uh, Digital Media and Democracy, Tactics in Hard Times, and The Affective Politics of Digital Media. Megan will be followed by Professor Lim, who is a Canada Research Chair in Digital Media and Global Network Society with, uh, with the School of Journalism and Communication at Carleton University. Among her noted publications are Roots, Roots, Routers, uh, or Routers, Communication and Media of Contemporary Social Movements and Online Collective Action, Dynamics of the Crowds in Social Media. And, we will conclude with uh, Professor Fenwick McKelvey's um, uh, presentation. Fenwick is, and I'm doing that because I know Fenwick and we're in the same department, uh, is an associate professor in information and communication technology in the Department of Communication Studies at Concordia University. He is the author of Internet Demons, Digital Communications Possessed, which won um, the 2019 Gertrude Robinson Award and the co-author of The Permanent Campaign, New Media and New Politics, which is edited with Greg Elmer and Ganelle Lenglois, and both of them are going to be appearing in a subsequent seminar. So I'm going to turn it over to Ahmed uh, to start, and then we will entertain questions and um, comments in the chat. Thank you. Ahmed? Thank you very much, uh, Yasmin and um, Zainab for the introduction. My apologies, everyone, uh, for not turning my, the video on, but I just had actually surgery and it's a bit difficult for me even to talk, but uh, this is an important uh, event. Um, I, I'll start with an acknowledgement. I respectfully acknowledge that at Simon Fraser University, we live and work on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish uh, peoples of the Musqueam, Squamish and Sandwich Ruth nations. And uh, I understand, uh, Yasmin, uh, we have about 15 minutes, correct? To, uh, yeah, perfect, okay. So I'm sharing my slides and uh, yeah, um, I'll begin just uh, by pointing out that uh, this presentation is part of uh, a larger project. I have been working, uh, been really lucky working with uh, 
a group of talented uh, scholars and researchers uh, at Simon Fraser University. Uh, and today's uh, presentation, uh, I'll be focusing on three areas that would tie well with the focus of this uh, seminar. Uh, so I will talk about algorithms and um, uh, I will also mention a couple of um, aspects that are, uh, in my mind, uh, a bit under-researched. Um, so uh, we are actually planning on releasing our uh, final product, which is a very long report by hopefully by the end of March. And it will include, uh, we now have more than 160 pages of uh, mapping far right um, uh, hate and disinformation in Canada. We started the project in mid 2021. So long before the protests in Ottawa. And um, when the protests happened actually, it um, aligned well with what we have already found. Okay, so now I should stop and uh, move on to the presentation. But yeah, so it will be released hopefully soon. Okay, so uh, I'll start with uh, the algorithm because I saw when Zainab sent me this email, the word algorithm is there. I thought, yeah, let's, let do, let's do some work on algorithm. Uh, one thing about algorithm is that um, there is a lot of theoretical discussion on it, what it means and so on, but there is really little empirical study on algorithm. In other words, how can we really understand algorithms? One of the main procedures that could be, in my mind, very useful was, was what we call uh, reverse engineering. These, what they call black boxes which means um, if the um, companies do not share information, we can actually uh, go in reverse and try um, like uh, using search, certain search terms in order to figure out what kind of rules they have in place. So one of the tricks, so let's say uh, activities we have been doing with Google searches is Googling the names of conspiracy theorists, far right groups, uh, mass killers, terrorists, and trying to figure out what kind of description is associated with these figures. So this is again part of the black boxes of Google. And um, you know, from what I understand, Google has really uh, escaped censure and uh, blame for a very long time. But I think Google is um, um, implicated here, uh, is um, complicit in terms of promoting these far right uh, groups as well as conspiracies. So one feature in Google search is called the subtitle. And now not all people have subtitles associated with them, except for famous people. I think Fenwick, you have one, um, Yasmin maybe, you are famous people, but others do not usually have uh, a subtitle. So for instance, if you Google Alex Jones, you know, Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist, the subtitle associated with this uh, guy is American radio host. Um, the argument we are making here is that Google algorithms, when it comes to the subtitle, um, I think the subtitle is a subdivision or a subcategory of the autocomplete. It's not the same as autocomplete, but it's like associated with it. And no one can influence Google in changing it. It's like uh, designed by the algorithms themselves. So the argument I'm uh, making here, and we have done actually research on that by Googling so many people is that Google is never showing any negative uh, descriptions of conspiracy theorists and uh, hate uh, group members. Almost always they are either neutral or even positive. So this one is, for instance, neutral, American radio host. But of course, you know, it has destructive impact on politics. Uh, another example. Ezra Levant, have a look at this. Ezra Levant is described as an activist. The word activist, I think, like if you look at it from a language perspective, is more like and more positive. And that's a description associated with this guy. He's not even a journalist, a Canadian activist. A third example is uh, Gavin McInnes, the, the person who uh, created uh, Proud Boys. Proud Boys, as you know, is labeled by the Canadian 
government as a terrorist, uh, as a terrorist group, but now he is described here um, in a neutral way, Canadian writer, um, you know, disregarding all the work he's done in conspiracy and promoting hate and so on. Um, I'm arguing here that this is a very problematic issue. Google is not really blamed for it. We've written already a paper, which is now under review, whereby we looked at all the conspiracy theorists. We also, in the report, looked at uh, Canadian far-right actors, and we could not find a single negative description. That's the problem with Google. Okay, moving on to something else, uh, which in my mind is, again, uh, under-researched, uh, which is Amazon. Uh, we found that that on Amazon, especially the books, there are so many sections and pages promoting hate, uh, white supremacy, and very problematic ideologies. I'm going to take two examples only. Uh, one by Gavin McInnes. I'm focusing on the Canadians because that's part of the project and uh, Lauren Southern. Uh, but of course, you can find so many other examples available on uh, Amazon Books, which is again, it's like uh, Amazon is not there in the, uh, uh, you know, in the discussion, in the public discourse about hate. It's like it's somewhere else. We only hear about Jeff Bezos being, being the richest man or going to space, but nothing else. But uh, I think it's very problematic. So I'll, I'll start with uh, Lauren Southern, a well-known far-right activist. Uh, well, she calls herself activist or provocateur. I don't think it's the right word. So this is how the hair book uh, is promoted on uh, Amazon. Now, notice uh, that there is a description of the author, which is very, very positive, and uh, so many like links to her uh, work. And then there is another section, I think Zainabi just mentioned uh, ben, uh, ben Shapiro, uh, Ezra Levant and so many others. So in case you, you are bored with uh, Lauren Southern, you can find so many other examples. It's like, again, this is part of the algorithmic uh, suggestions uh, given by, by Amazon, which is problematic. Not only that, Amazon provides different versions or formats of the book. So in case you don't have enough money, you can buy the Kindle edition. Uh, the most problematic thing in my mind is also some of these books, when they are out of stock, are actually printed by Amazon. So when I, and that's a problem I faced, like, shh, I need to study these books. So shall I buy these books or not? Like I thought for months before buying them, but I thought the, the benefit of buying them and studying them outweigh the, uh, the disadvantage. So I did buy them. Hence, I'm making the presentation about these books. So I think there was a benefit behind buying uh, these, <coughs> sorry, behind buying these books, sorry. Last thing when it comes to Amazon is that um, it also allows people to comment. So notice 689 people commented and uh, rated the book and it provides like a mini social uh, media platform to discuss Lauren Southern and uh, create some kind of fandom around her. So uh, that when it comes to the promotion of hate, Amazon is really well ahead. And I find this to be problematic and rarely mentioned in the public discourse. Um, yeah. Okay, so just to give you some excerpts from Lauren Southern. So one of her uh, main targets uh, is Muslim, Islam and Muslims. So for her, I mean, uh, she regards Muslims as having fundamental problems that are intrinsically, intrinsically related uh, to, the, to their own nature. I mean, I apologize for uh, citing a very long quotation, but I think it's important to have a look at what kind of books uh, Amazon is actually selling. So have a look at this. It says on uh, page 50, it might be cruel to shoot a wolf charging at your child with this George uh, slavery, but it's not bigoted. In other words, it's okay to kill someone. Uh, and by the way, the wolf here is uh, a, a representation of Muslim. Wolves are predators. They pose danger to defenseless humans. While individual Muslims can no doubt be decent and noble people, just as tame wolves do exist, the fact is that Islam, the religion, is by its nature dangerous to the West. 
We can't have compassion for people who have never known any other way of thinking, just as we have, uh, we have compassion for cancer patients without excusing the diseases. Well, I find this to be really problematic. It's like promoting genocide. Another um, you know, uh, point on multiculturalism and immigration. Uh, so when she talks about, um, uh, for instance, uh, immigration, she says, uh, she's definitely having a problem with both. She's, uh, she claims that they both throw in traditional values of Western societies, asserting that if the West accepts too many immigrants, we lose the ability to assimilate them and everything goes to, you know, yeah. So the point is to assimilation, not integration. They have to change. That's her own mind view. This is because mass migration in her mind is the destruction of the economy, of our culture and the very moral, the moral norms. Immigrants, after all, are hordes of uneducated fanatics and criminals. And then she says they are actually human garbage. That's page 80. You know, I, again, I find it to be very, yeah, really problem, problematic when, when, uh, when we see this uh, on Amazon. To solve the problem, Selvin suggests that the national origins of immigrants need to be factored in so that limits on immigration from other Western countries can be removed. In other words, she only wants white immigrants to come to Canada and Western uh, countries. In this way, pan-Western nationalism uh, will, uh, will be, uh, is definitely awesome because it will solve all the problems of the West. The second uh, um, book is by Gavin McInnes. And in this book, he talks about freedom of expression and so on. I, I, I found it to be really funny because in this book, he defends Alex Jones' conspiracy uh, in relation to frogs uh, turning gay. He said, well, you know what? Um, because by, by only saying facts alone, it could be a very boring way of telling you a true fact. I don't know what kind of argumentation he's making here. In other words, it's okay to embellish um, your language and add some exaggerations in order to make it more exciting, more interesting for people to hear it, uh, which I find really um, hard to understand. And then he defends uh, the creation of Proud Boys uh, and uh, showing himself, projecting uh, himself and his followers as victims of liberals, asserting that it's a lie that white supremacy is the real terrorist danger. And of course, he goes back to Islam and immigrants being the problem, often picturing himself as a free speech warrior who hasn't uh, forced to, to be deplatformed. However, when it comes to deplatformization, his books are sold on, on Amazon. So I'm not seeing any kind of deplatformization here. Okay, so that's the second thing. The last thing I, uh, yeah, and the conclusion is definitely these books clearly show, I think I mentioned it, that the ideology of the authors, and this is highly problematic done by uh, Amazon. So we have a lot of promotion of Christian norms, uh, toxic masculinity and white supremacy uh, in these books. My last uh, uh, point in this presentation is related to the dark web. And I think again, and uh, when it comes to the dark web, it's a bit under-researched, especially when it comes to uh, the Canadian far right. Uh, so we, uh, we purchased uh, a few tools that allowed us to search. It's really hard to do searching on the dark web because it's not indexed like Google, uh, like uh, Google indexing websites around the world. Uh, so uh, the, even the available uh, services are not great, but we tried our best. Um, what we found in early 2022, that's bef before the protests in Ottawa, we found some uh, right-wing extremist content, especially in relation to the QAnon uh, conspiracy. When it comes to Canada, I found that most of the content was actually related to the COVID vaccine passports, you know, selling you fake passports or what they call QR codes uh, for a, a certain amount of uh, money. But that was mostly on the dark web. Uh, we also uh, wanted to look at something interesting in relation to blockchain technology, which is cryptocurrency. And uh, uh, when I looked, I was a bit like really surprised by what I had seen. 
Again, I, I did the search early in early January, 2022. That's before the, uh, the protest in Ottawa. I found Stephen Moliner, he well-known white supremacist uh, who lives, I think in, in Ontario. He actually received $77 million in cryptocurrency funding uh, in today's value. But of course, if you take into account the value at the time of the transaction, it's over 2.1 million. I, still, it's a lot of money uh, for, for one person, getting out so much funding from uh, different uh, anonymous uh, sources. Jordan Peterson comes second when it comes to the far right uh, groups. If you regard him as a far right group, I think he, he is sympathetic towards them. He got about 142,000, followed by Lawrence Southern. And uh, when it comes to the number of transactions, uh, again, Steve, Steve Van Moliner uh, had the highest number of transactions, over 5,000. Uh, so, so many people were actually giving him, and he's also giving to uh, others, mostly to his uh, podcast show or radio show. Uh, this was followed by Lauren Southern, and she had over five. 500 uh, transactions. Uh, but I found something interesting, and uh, this is something I'm going to share here. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to look at, I found a tool to trace the cryptocurrency uh, amounts as well as dates um, for each person, uh, each person when it comes to the far right group members. So I looked at Lawrence Southern uh, St uh, and uh, Faith Goldie. So starting with Faith Goldie, this is how it looks like. So this is the distribution from uh, November 2017 up to tw uh, early uh, 2022. And then I looked at Lawrence Southern and something uh, caught my attention, uh, which is the following. Both Faith Goldie and Lawrence Southern re received one Bitcoin uh, which is equivalent to about $14,000 at that time, 2018. The only difference was, was the timing, uh, which was you know about 10 minutes difference between one payment and the uh, other. When I looked at the sender, I found that the same person actually paid another one Bitcoin to another uh, far-right provocateur and anti-feminist uh, person called Rebecca Har Hargraves. Um, and then another payment was made. And they, these three individuals are all female far-right uh, provocateurs. So I'm arguing here is that the donation seems to be rewarding female figures who express similar views about anti-feminism, anti-liberal ideas, and anti-BIPOC uh, uh, ideology. But I think this requires further investigation because this is a very interesting area of research. And that's it, my, that's it for my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thanks uh, very much for that really insightful um, and interesting uh, analysis. I'm curious about who actually made the donation. Uh, I'm not going to take questions right now, although there is one in the Q&A for you, Ahmed, uh, but I will come back to that later. So I'd like to now call on Megan uh, Bowler to please uh, present your findings or your analysis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Yes, that was very interesting. I'm so looking forward to the conversation. All right, so um, just going to jump right in. Understanding right-wing extremism and hate speech raises challenging questions, of course, which include, what are the affective dimensions of our ideological attachments? And how are emotions weaponized in social media? Since 2016, my research has been dedicated to trying to answer these questions. And that research includes the book pictured here, Affective Politics of Digital Media, which uh, which contains chapters by uh, Yasmin, uh, Ahmed, Zainab, and Merlina, who are all here today. And in addition, I'm in the midst of a three-year funded shirk study. 
And I'm also delighted that this has been conducted with amazing graduate students, a team of about seven to 10 graduate students. And Michaline is actually in the, um, in the audience here today, and she's been key to helping develop some of this talk. So this innovative multidisciplinary mixed methods and grounded theory approach to understanding the role of emotional expression in social media, particularly is going to focus today on our insights that have developed over just this third year that we're now in on the role of melodrama and ressentiment in polarization. But I want to begin with a quick overview of the state of current scholarship and political communications on emotion, social media, and politics to illustrate some of the gaps in understanding the role emotion plays in these polarizing dynamics of social media. There's an increasing amount of theoretical work regarding this, this, uh, this triumvirate of media, emotions, and politics, but only a very small handful of mixed method studies in this area. The dominant approaches to the study of affect and emotion and politics come from social psychology and political science and utilize predominantly quantitative measures. These include the nascent field of affective polarization, which measures emotion in terms of negative and positive feelings towards political parties. As well, there's a very frequently cited uh, work on emotional contagion and how so-called moral emotions are claimed to diffuse more quickly within social media. The 2015 work of Zizi Papakrisi fortunately provided a key intervention in this narrow purview and brought work from the humanities into the field of political communications. And one of her key contributions was to identify the storytelling infrastructures that define Twitter's affective publics. And that's uh, useful to the work I'll be talking about today here. However, this work of hers is also solely quantitative and her measures of affective effective intensity is in fact simply a measure of retweet count. So just in the past couple of years though, new directions are being suggested from diverse quarters. So even some of the more conservative areas of political science are, are starting to see this gap. So for example, I just discovered a 2021 special issue on quote, the affective processes in political context in the Journal of Politics and Government Governance. And the editors outline the shortcomings and key directions that need to be taken given the narrow purview of uh, the work in psychology and political science. They point out what has been uh, very perplexing and frustrating to our own work, that is the lack of interdisciplinarity, the fact that psychology focuses on the individual as the unit of analysis, which doesn't in fact translate well to political contexts and the need to understand emotion in politics requires understanding collective processes and how emotions develop within and between groups. Another uh, person I was surprised to find in a journal of religious studies is a scholar named Mona Abdel Fahil and she describes the problem in a way that really gets uh, what I find to be the, the issue. She says, the analysis of affect ought to deal with the range of emotions rather than lumping all feelings into an indistinct category. So for example, the affective polarization talks about negative versus positive, doing, you know, lumping everything into one category. And it needs to, we need to allow for shifting and intermingled emotions. Future research must pay attention to how affect plays out in different ways contingent on a person's positionality. We must also pay attention to what differing emotions do. And there she's referring to the work of Sarah Ahmed and thinking about really the, the political function of emotion. So that's some of the framework in which um, we are making our contribution. To address these gaps now in our third year, we're looking at how emotional expression that's linked to narratives surrounding race and racism in election related social media how we can best study that. So it's both um, what I'm gonna share with you primarily today are some of our theoretical insights that we've just developed, but we've also really spent uh, an intensive two years developing what may help uh, new methodologies 
develop that are, are much needed, as I've said. So during the 2019 Canadian and 2020 US elections, we engaged mixed methods and grounded theory, beginning with a four month digital ethnography leading up to each election, during which we tracked developing stories and cross-partisan debates on Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook and YouTube in Canada. In the US, we focused on Twitter, Facebook, and Gab. We looked at debates about race in the Canadian context, which included Trudeau's blackface incident in the US, the January 6th Capitol riots and insurrection, and in the and alongside debates regarding Black Lives Matter and the lie of a stolen election. We coded 5,000 social media posts across the two elections, engaging qualitative and quantitative approaches, ongoing literature, as well as con consultations with numerous experts in the areas of sentiment analysis, computational linguistics, NLP, and qualitative research. While engaging many traditional mixed methods approaches, our work is also unusually interdisciplinary, and we've specifically brought humanities and sociology work into conversation with these social sciences. For example, we have, um, our work has been theoretically sensitized by concepts from sociologist Arlie Hochschild, and particularly her concepts of deep stories and feeling roles. In wanting to understand the affective investments underlying ideologies, Hochschild's concept of deep stories describes the, just this. So she developed this after her four year ethnography in the, in the US South, looking, working with the Tea Party. And the way that she exemplifies the deep, a deep story is this, that the people she was speaking with felt that they were metaphorically in line for the American dream. And they were waiting in line, doing what they needed to do. And that in the context of affirmative action and equity and diversity, et cetera, and then with Obama's presidency, the, the sensation, the feeling was that Obama was waving while people of color um, got, took cuts in line and got to the American dream before them. So that's an example of a deep story. And it's characterized by pain, blame, and a rescue narrative. Another concept from her that's particularly valuable is feeling roles, which refers to the emotional accounting system within each deep story and governs what a group should or should not feel or express about unfolding events. So our coding schema. Any of you who've done qualitative work will say, oh my God, how did you possibly deal with so many, um, so many codes? This developed over two years as we persisted in tracking these emotional expressions related to racial narratives and stories of uh, pain, blame, and rescue. And although we attempted many times to reduce the number of coding families and codes, we discovered again and again that all of these coding families were necessary to fully understand emotions in their political context. So in addition to coding the emotion, so we would look at a, each individual social media post in a, say um, a, probably a total of 40 threads, we would look at each post in that conversation and these were cross-partisan conversations and we would ask ourselves what emotion is expressed but not just what emotion ex is expressed, but what are the linguistic markers of that emotional expression, the rhetorical strategies that are used to express that, and perhaps especially important is the object of emotion. What is that emotion directed towards? So that points out uh, one of the things that I think is so key in our work, and that is that anger, for example, cannot mean the same thing in every context. And that may be very obvious to us. And yet in the work that I was describing before in political communications, we don't really have language to talk about these particularities. So as we coded these 5,000 posts, what became clear was something we really had not anticipated. So this is primarily this third year that we've articulated this. And, and uh, Mihaline deserves uh, credit for much of this, some of this insight here. Namely that every, the very nature of social media platforms and their affordances is that emotional expressions are almost inevitably channeled into melodrama. 
or what we call melodramatic collective political storytelling. So the affordances of social media require this truncated, abbreviated performative theatrical expression and the reductive and simplified nature of social media communications enforces this simplified binary structure of melodramatic storytelling, such as victim versus villain, good versus evil, evil moral and psychological absolutes, rhetorical excess, self-righteousness, irony. So I'm going to just show a few slides that illustrate some of the coding we did and the percentages of these codes um, on, the, on the right. We looked at both right and left and, and there's interesting comparisons of this, but just to illustrate some of the coding that demonstrates this melodrama. So perceptions of the evil, uh, sorry, uh, the multicultural, uh, the melodramatic collective political storytelling um, came, came uh, visible through the beliefs about self coding category, which clearly revealed this structure. For example, the primary belief about the in-group is that they are victimized or oppressed. And this was the case for 58% of both the left and the right leaning storytellers. The second most frequently expressed belief is that one's in-group is justified or innocent. These perceptions of the evil enemy, for example, or these binary, um, you know, binary nature of this melodramatic storytelling structure also emerge through our emotions codes and object of emotions codes. So on the left, you see the most frequently expressed emotions, all strongly negative. And on the right, you see the objects of the emotions. The right-leaning users directed the majority of emotions, 38%, at the other users posting in the social media thread, which is an interesting conversation that a lot of the negative sentiment is actually towards the other poster who stands in for um, the larger, you know, object of emotion. The second most common was uh, racialized others who were the target of emotion for 20, 20%, and 18% directed at left and Democrats with the election process and news media, both coming in and 11% followed by Black Lives Matter. Another key feature of melodrama is the rhetorical excess, if you recall. And the rhetoric that framed emotional expression overwhelmingly came in the form of formidably excessive and strong conflict language, name calling, us and them language, blaming and moral claims. Another key feature of melodrama is rhetorical excess. Oh wait, uh, sorry, that's where I was, okay. As we have begun analyzing our coding and the insights about melodrama and its implications for polarization, we returned to theories of democracy. So many of us will know that one of the leading theories of democracy, deliberative democracy, presumes a rather rational state of politics, that politics is, is about rational judgments and evaluations, et cetera, that the public sphere takes this rational form. Chantal Mouffe is famous for her uh, conception of agonistic pluralism. And that uh, drew us because unlike, unlike deliberative democracy, agonistic pluralism values the passions and emotions. And Chantal Mouffe strongly emphasizes that in her idealized uh, version of democracy in the public sphere, the passions have a very key role and if they are mobilized in the correct way. What we discovered was that almost point by point, the melodramatic collective political storytelling structure works systematically against the requirements of agonistic pluralism. So for example, the melodrama positions the other as an enemy to be destroyed rather than as the legitimate opponent or adversary it mobilizes passions towards catharsis and crystallizing the in-group identities rather than mobilizing passions toward democratic designs as Mouffe would prefer to have it. Rather than transforming antagonism into agonism, 
which she sees as the aim of democratic politics, this melodramatic storytelling results in an explosion of antagonisms that tear up the very basis of civility. So the upshot of that is that um, that melodramatic storytelling simply uh, works against the the possibility of democracy as far as we are able to tell. And in many ways, of course, that's what's new about that. We have known that social media works against our democratic interest for some time now. But um, as I'll try to summarize now, there is a lot of value in understanding that the emotions that we are concerned about in hate speech or right-wing extremism don't just appear out of nowhere. They don't just appear in a vacuum, but they are part of uh, a storytelling structure. Time precludes detailing our insights regarding ressentiment, but our grounded theory has evidenced this complex compound emotion across the political spectrum, but especially on the right. There has been a resurgence of scholarly attention, interestingly, to ressentiment. This idea, this compound emotion, was originally developed by Nietzsche and then by Scheller and was more recently popularized in Wendy Brown's 1989 essay in Wooden Detachments. In an argument still relevant today, Wendy Brown detailed how class-based politics grounded in shared experience of economic oppression under capitalism were displaced by the resurgence of individualism with neoliberalism combined with the identity politics that became popular in the 1980s and 90s, as we know. Identity politics, she argues, require that we remain attached to an identity that is defined by exclusion from the dominant majority. And this, this um, basically is an identity as a victim, an identity as a victim uh, excluded, right? Which breeds a profound ressentiment. That's the basis of ressentiment is that that inability to shift out of that victim role in part. And as we know, and as our past years of research have made clear, identity politics and culture wars are alive and well with the 21st century twist that white people now claim status as victims. And this is of course, one of the key deep stories, right? That story of the American dream is an example of that. A number of recent scholarly articles are exploring ressentiment within the rhetoric of Trump in populist and reactionary politics in the US. And most recently, I've discovered a 2021 special issue of the journal Politics and Governance featuring cross-disciplinary scholarship on reactionary politics and resentful affect in populist times that focuses on the European context. And again, um, the quote I mentioned from the religious studies scholar, scholar about needing uh, the analysis of affect to deal with the range of emotions rather than lumping them all into one category and allowing for the study of intermingled emotions. I think her point really comes to bear with the importance of something like ressentiment. So in conclusion, to return to the opening question, how can we best understand how emotional expression and social media platforms contributes to polarization and right-wing extremism? Understanding emotions requires not merely studying them in isolation, counting their frequency, measuring generalized negative versus positive emotions. Rather, we need to engage these multidisciplinary approaches and mixed methods to explore emotional expressions within their natural habitat, that is within language, discourse, narrative, and storytelling structures. Just as fact-checking artificially isolates variables such as a so-called fact within the complexity of disinformation narratives or conspiracy thinking, so does the study of singular emotions artificially isolate them from the complexity of their expression as defined by audience, rhetoric, and storytelling structures. Our work evidences that the very affordances of social media forcibly channel emotional expression into melodrama. And just as emotions don't exist in a vacuum, Neither do the discourses such as us, them, and political science is famous for studying this us, them um, uh, binary discourse. But these in-group and out-group binaries, long this focus in poli-sci, don't exist in a vacuum, but are reinforced by imposed structures of melodrama. 
melodramatic collective political storytelling and pointedly not romance, not tragedy, not comedy, but melodrama. In summary, our findings regarding emotional expression and melodrama provide insight into these debates about whether or not and how social media contributes to polarization and may work against democracy. Finally, our research evidences the degree to which ressentiment is defining contemporary politics. It's our hope that these efforts to understand emotions, politics, and social media in greater complexity provide key tools useful to interrupt the potent storytelling and networked propaganda of right-wing extremism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, really interesting stuff. And I'm really looking forward to uh, air, your output, the report that comes out or the book that comes out at the end. Um, and also, Ahmed, I have a question that is also asking the very same thing about your report as to when it's going to come out and where it can be accessed. So we can talk about this some more later. But right now, I'd like to ask uh, Marlena, uh, Dr. Lim, if you can come on. And uh, great, thank you. So, uh, OK. So uh, thank you for. Uh, opportunity to to be in this panel this exciting one i look forward to the conversation uh, so my presentation today tonight is based on work in progress slowly uh, progressing i started in 2019 which is which is on rhythms and algorithms of uh, progressive and, and regressive social movements, where I combine global scan of various social movement, both regressive and, and uh, civil and uncivil throughout time using history, history and existing data and existing literature. And then I focus on several snapshot, empirical snapshot where I look in depth on certain contexts some of you who are familiar with my root routes, routers, I use similar methods in combining big picture and smaller picture. So this is not really, this is a preliminary result and I'm going a bit on the scan one and I choose to, uh, because of the topic of today, I choose on two aspects, two theoretical concepts that I came across uh, through my research, namely, uh, algorithmic brokerage and conspiratorial discursive activism. So these are not the site of my in-depth studies, but I'm just throwing these uh, pictures. So as we speak, right, in the last several months, we've seen big ones in, in I mean, uh, the Freedom Convoy in Canada where where vaccination rates actually 81.1%. And today, I mean, actually, virtually the largest anti-vaccine mandates uh, protests actually unravel in New Zealand, in Wellington to be sure, but also all over other places. Less known by international audience is, uh, sorry, that's not Canada, 85.6 is actually South Korea. That's, uh, I forgot to, uh, change. So South Korea is actually there. There is there has been several protests, smaller, but it is ongoing. And also Australia has been uh, there has been ongoing protests in in uh, similarly in Australia. All of these places have very high uh, vaccination rates, and unvaccinated anti-vaccine actually is very a minority. They are minority and. Again, people are surprised. Why? Why are these people are for protesting? But also, these are not countries that are known for having large crowd uh, protesting, right? Uh, or violent protests. We we heard about the United States or somewhere in the Middle East, but not much in these countries. So we heard also media portray. 
this protest, like including the one in Ottawa, is like anti vaccine mandates protests have been hijacked by far right and right things. Uh, and this is this is also the same reporting about other protests in other places. The reality is actually, if you look closely, they are not changing into, they are not morphed into extreme right sort of like protests. In fact, they are organized and led by extreme right groups. And to a certain degree, they work together. And some groups are similar. They both anti-facts and far right at the same time from the beginning. So both of them also, they feel they are in minority. Either they, they're the same group or sometimes not. They are marginalized, persecuted by the mass, by the vaccine, by other, other things. But these are, has been, this all, these are, uh, this, the feeling, the sense of injustice coming, like as if they are minority, marginalized, and persecuted is actually, has been there before COVID. Uh, so why, while Freedom Convoy, or let's say other names it being adopted when, when they have this big, large anti-vaccine mandates rally, Essentially, they are all built on existing networks that include COVID-related groups of network that emerged in the last two years. They could be started in anti-mask, anti-vaccine, anti-lockdown, and they include people from largely conservative to the far right, but also their small group of left, extreme left, who are against this, this uh, measure. Uh, and extreme rights groups that have been emerging much longer. Uh, some of the groups in Canada, they back, back to early 2000s, for example, uh, but also include political figures, especially from official political parties. This is true for all the countries, especially those four, uh, and celebrities, including especially actually social media celebrity. And so social media was the main platform for right wing. And, and uh, that's what literature said and also my own observation. But also now has become the main platform. Obviously the last two years, since my different piece of talking about rhythm changed the way our, our rhythms and our life has been incorporated online, right? Obviously, just like everything else, social media become the main platform. But also not because it's free and ubiquitous, but also there is a notion that mainstream media is co-opted and left this. For example, in Korea, South Korea, it's like um, the far right uh, elderly who became far right, member of part of they said they believe that the mainstream media is so leftist, they're, they're uh, communists, uh, they only they are communists only only trying to spread communism, for example. And within this, also within these two type of groups, whether it's COVID or, or or extreme right groups, conspiracy theory and disinformation are actually the main weapon. So that is, it is not, it is only obvious why. Uh, they mingle or they are the same group, but also there is a sort of like overlap between the two groups. Extreme right groups, just like non-profit organization, they, are, they are also use social media for three things. You know, non-profit and civil society organization use social media for three things, information, spread information, provide information, community building, community making, and mobilize action. Except that it is not information, but it is disinformation that become the uh, routine sort of type of communication that extreme right trying to, mm. to spread on social media. And to, within, Propagation of disinformation, conspiracy theories that actually become 
the, the main type of narratives that they generate. And cultivation of community is really based on a fact, actually, right? As I already, uh, I'm so glad that I speak after Ahmed and Megan because a lot of things I don't have to explain. So, and uh, it needs to be enemy, it's sort of like binary. Without enemy, there is no community. So they need to have enemy. And then this historical lineage, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand share the same lineage, like from, from anti-communists, anti-immigrants, and anti-Muslim. Right? Uh, South Korea is rather different, but it's all anti-communism, uh, anti-North uh, stay and still being used as a, as a sort of like narrative to generate animosity against the other, against the government. And there is also some more recent event, like in Korea, for example, the ousting of President Park, conservative uh, in, in 2016, that was a big one that unified the far right. And they're all issue and even driven. The, the, the personality of, of conspiracy theories and anti, like enemy making narrative is extreme right could piggyback or any issue, literally any issue that is hot, that is trending, right? So now it is about anti-COVID, uh, anti-vaccine mandate, but it could be about a uh, pipeline, right? It could be about other things. Uh, the price could be about financial crisis, could be about election. They're all also using mixed platform, which is broadcast and interactive, and they have public and private. For example, some, uh, combine Spotify and Facebook, or let's say in New Zealand, like YouTube and Twitter and Gap or Parler. Parler is kind of uh, popular there. In, in um, South Korea is YouTube channel. And then you have Facebook sometimes as public place and then have Kakao Talk, talk which is a, a messaging type, uh, similar to tel Telegram, but it's most popular in, in Korea. This is not quite my research. Actually, it's not about it. But I was in the middle of trying to understand what happened in 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 Ottawa, and one night I made this. So, so I was just like, okay, why not showing it? So this actually because it fits what I was thinking. That's most of the big actually number of freedom convoy, prominent most prominent actors. They are conspiracy theorists or uh, conspiracy or disinformation super, spread, super, super spreader on, on uh, social media. So, and they also have this group with social media dominance and hyperactivities. For example, you see Henry Hildebrand with no more like lockdown. He's like a, uh, here James Bowder, right? These are, these are people who has been before that. This, really big with conspiracy theories. Also, this also based on existing network built prior to and during the pandemic. It's not new. They might have new name from uh, Maverick Brexit to Maverick Party, but, but also there is a connection to prior event. The closest is United We Roll in Yellow Fest. Canada that I happen to collect the data even though I never wrote about it. So I look at that, those data that I collected back then. And, and also some of this group, like Canada First, uh, Plate Army, they were pretty good with, his, with online fundraising. So there is a habit, there is like a routine and there is skill that they are gained over time. Not to mention that it's transnational network, right? But QAnon is big, is virtually in all countries that QAnon is adopted by conspiracy theorists, anti-fax movements, uh, and right-wing extremists in many other places, including in Asia, even when they don't really know those uh, stories were originated from QAnon, for example. I might share this on Twitter later if you are interested. This also will in progress because my things. So uh, what I will focus 
is there are two things, right? Like I said, algorithmic procreates. But first, I think uh, what we see generally, it's not only among the right wing. We see how right wing extremism use or exploit algorithmic algorithms in a way they do because we see the rise of algorithmic politics in general, which is politic that center is modus moder operandi around algorithmic monitoring of issue with, with a core purpose of dominating media sphere to steer public opinion. And this is done by parties, official parties, liberal, conservative, independent, every single political entities and figures. And, and because social media algorithm, I think we, we learned that from uh, Ahmed al uh, also Megan Bowler's presentation, is actually is not neutral. First, social media algorithm works using machine learning principle that over time would amplify certain pattern, the behavior of its user. And also it has sorting typology, especially when it comes to user page, page ranks, it's using sorting typology where the top matters, winner takes all type kind of, which is very neoliberal of course, right? Where visibility meaning equal with quantitative popularity, which we talk about amplifying bias is not only one time of amplifying like in one direction, it is exponential amplification because it's, it keeps being fed by the same pattern again and again. So the inequality between content has become higher and higher, higher. Therefore, eventually it actually benefit the extreme because the extreme cultivate extreme emotion. Because what we see, right? Uh, the, uh, we, 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 we saw the, the whistleblower um, recently, several months ago, that Facebook actually assigned five times higher score for uh, emotional re reaction emojis rather than emoticons rather than likes, right? To hate it or to love it is more valuable in terms of visibility. So there, there are a lot of uh, things that are happening here, but I would just talking about two things. The first one is uh, algorithmic brokerage. So brokerage is very, uh, very important in social movements in making collective actions because collective action essentially is about making networks and social movement is about growing Making social movement is about growing your networks to be really large, to reach the mass, right? There's network and ties that form the structure. So the brokerage occur when a certain con nodes connects to nodes that are otherwise separated. So in this case, in, in the old time traditional social movement, you have in-person connection, you have you have to show in public to make that brokerage happen, reaching out to other groups, having the liberation. This is basically slow, right? Brokerage also random. But algorithmic help that process to, autom to automize that process mm -hmm. and making it possible that new connection is possible by algorithmic dynamic through search ring, page rank, user fit, and recommendation. And for right-wing extremist group, they don't dream, they don't have no desire to actually reach out to someone like me or you. Because we are on the, on the red spectrum, right? Like, because it's psychologically is hard to convert anybody just because uh, someone who is on the progressive lab, uh, for someone who is on progressive, just because they see the same conspiracy theory or, or over and over again, 12 times a day, they would not become far right. So the strategy is, is not, it's not quite echo chamber or filter bubble. It's actually, there's a right? 
So I think filter bubble because it's stuck on the same bubble kind of ideology. It is actually an attempt to nudge you to shift a little bit to the right every time you consume something. So drift to the far right by affect exploitation, becoming angrier and angrier and wanting to search answer for certain questions by, but also at the same time, they don't present this right group, this far right group, they don't present you with some, uh, some weird, strange story. That is familiarity and fluency. For example, in the case of South, South Korean Christian elderly, they become forefront of anti-vaccine mandate in South Korea, along with anti-feminist youth, male youth who believe that South Korean uh, young women would never marry them because they're all anti, they're feminists, right? So they mingle, which is kind of odd. But for South Christian elderly, uh, when they eventually become going to the far right, which is which is a target cookie, which is a this is a type of group that movements that uh, that is belong to far right, they consume, for example, uh, because they got into the routine of watching YouTube Christian channel with mega churches uh, uh, have their own. In South Korea, they all have YouTube channel. And in fact, nine of 10 news, uh, social commentary channel, they are, nine of them are conservative, even though the government is more on socialist, right? More on center leftist. So once they watch and they click YouTube recommendation, they could possibly expose to something that is a bit rightist. If they, after the, the, it is very, very thin. The, if you hear the preacher from Megachur talking about coffee as, and as a sign of the end of the world, and with the revelation, what, with the, uh, let's say, uh, story of the mark of the beast, right? Which is, which is really, that's being, preach in many evangelical churches, like this kind of global crisis is the sign of the end of time. And this will lead them very easily drifting to the more right, to the conspiracy theory about Bill Gates, that actually that is as an actor behind pandemic and Bill Gates is Jewish too, so it fits right, biblical story, that with microchips is as a mark of the beast that's actually fit the scripture in Revelation 13, verses 16 on 13. So, and then once they click that, the next YouTube recommendation will just lead you to more the rabbit hole of far right content that over time they drifted to the rise through actually family and fluency. So it taps into something that there was no influence. So the brokers happen like that. And the time and crisis just become the vehicles for this to keep going, right? The network just become larger because of time and crisis. The more crisis, more uncertainty, more fear, you more likely to be that. Uh, another one is, there is a, what I call conspiratorial discursive activism. Basically, by having not only broadcasts like YouTube, but also place like a call talk or telegram chats or gaps forum, is actually to have this conspiratorial discursive activism where people are within a certain enclave. I have a previous concept, it's called an algorithmic enclave people actually uh, being bound by first by the same enemy, but also they, they feel they have to challenge the opposing discourse, the especially mainstream discourse, right? Like for example, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, about COVID is to challenge the official, the needs for lockdown by having this, this uh, sort of discussion. And 
from YouTube channel going to Kakao Talk, and you see that that's it, like the in the case of elderly, and then uh, they are there talking about the same thing, trying to confirm their stories, and eventually they deliberated. They are deliberated over the same thing, then become convinced of uh, the truthfulness about the absolute truthfulness of certain story. So there are more, more things that, that needs to happen, right? First, the formation of enclaves and their brokerage, and you have this discourse, deliberative, uh, conspiratorial discursive activism. And once that happened, there is connected extreme right action. And then eventually you would be able to mobilize collective action. From this information to community to action is actually for every step, algorithm could be exploited to move the some individual uh, or small group, small attempt by a small right-wing group into what we see in Ottawa uh, in the last several weeks. And the network growth is facilitated by time and crisis. So to a certain degree, for me, my ability to understand extreme right is actually very much thanks to what unravel in places like Egypt, Tunisia, when I study progressive, pro-democratic movements, right? Because essentially, a lot of repertoire, tactic and strategy very similar, except that as we become more algorithmized and, and it's not every single type of content could be amplified, the bias itself is more friendly, algorithmic bias itself is more friendly to this kind of extreme content. Therefore, to a certain degree, I would say, if we don't do anything, I mean, the algorithmic transparency, everything, we just keep drifting to the right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlena. Um, that's really fascinating. And it actually ties in very much with what uh, Zainab was saying in her introduction about the overturn window and that being pushed further and further out. So I'm going to turn now to Fenwick McKelvey. Um, Fenwick, thank you. And please start. Great, thank you so much. And I just want to say thank you so much for the fellow panelists. It's a real pleasure to be here and, and be part of these fantastic talks. So it's like a real uh, privilege and pleasure. Um, and yeah, and I'm looking forward to the discussion too. It's really fantastic research. Um, and just before I begin, I want to acknowledge that where I'm located, Cordia University, is located on the unceded indigenous lands. The Galagahage Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters in which we gather today. Jojage or Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. And we respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future and our ongoing relationship with indigenous and other peoples and the Montreal community. And I think that, you know, particularly in the time, you know, dealing post-convoy, I'm particularly thoughtful and mindful of, of different political groups, relationships with the land, and, that, and certainly the convoy's entitlement to, uh, to occupation, be able to occupy land, speaks to, I think, clear connections about the politics of extractivism and settler colonialism that are deeply embedded in Canadian culture and that some of our works, uh, particularly our kind of continuing to work with the Canadian Journal of Communication on alt rights in Canada is trying to uncover and unpack. I think that certainly part of this conversation today is trying to draw a lesson from there uh, and be, to be mindful of the, the, the different uh, relations that communities and politics have to the land. Um, my presentation today really is a, a summary of some collaborative research, and so this is coming from a research team that I just want to acknowledge and thank. Uh, this is also the the, the first uh, public showcase of our logo for our group, the Machine Agencies. So you get this is the fir the first look of it. But I just want to thank the many many scholars who helped contribute, and our kind of fantastic team at Concordia University at the Milieu Agent uh, Milieu Institute uh, that's been leading what I'd like to talk about today is an investigation of 
algorithms and AI and their kind of qu questions and this relationship to what I talk about is discoverability and disinformation. And so the main point of my talk is that we need better terms to describe algorithmic harms because there's many types of algorithms and that they're principally meeting demands from users. And so what I'm going to get through today is talking through these three key points and their consequences for how do we study and think about algorithms. Now, often, what do we do when we worry about what we see online? Most often, we're talking about popular framings about how social media recommend information. And with lots of choice, often the discussion focuses on how we might self-select our friends into creating what's popularly called echo chambers, or how our choices train algorithms to create what we call filter bubbles. Now, problematically in Canada, our framing and our public literacy about algorithms is not well served by uh, conventional mainstream journalism. And so here's drawing from a study that Lee Bieber conducted about since 2018, what have been reporting on algorithms uh, for two principal video recommendation systems, TikTok and YouTube. And you can see that there's low, firstly, there's a low number of articles discussing these systems that there's a lower level in, in French and in, 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 than in English, and that most of these articles don't really include a definition of an algorithm. So this creates this concern that we don't really have very good public resources for explaining how these systems work. A lot of the coverage tends to be coming from trends or fads, but not really trying to do investigative research into what the consequences of algorithmic recommendations as these systems work in Canada, particularly trying to develop a more broader vocabulary for algorithmic harms. And that they're often focusing on that one type of algorithm so that um, the, that they're trying to emphasize one variable for optimization and that the focus doesn't really try to delineate the different types of publics, the different types of users um, that Megan Bowler and Marion Lim were describing that might be subject to different types of recommendations. So this is a real kind of gap in, in algorithmic literacy we we're encountering in Canada. And what I'd like to point out and suggest is that in thinking about algorithmic harms and filter bubbles or echo chambers, really what we're seeing is a is a way of problematizing this term that, that coming to promise in Canada due to C11, formerly known as C10, this term discoverability. And often we have a very narrow conception of that term, but I'd like to define, and this is myself and Rob Hunt, have defined uh, discoverability as a kind of media power constituted by content discovery platforms that coordinate users, content creators, and software to make content more or less engaging. And so what I'd like to turn to is how this concept of discoverability can help us broaden what we think of and might describe as algorithmic harms and really pay attention to specifically what are these ways that algorithms might be intervening and causing the recommendation of harmful or problematic content. And so we have three concepts that we commonly use to describe or talk through discoverability. Uh, surrounds, vectors, and experiences. And I'll walk through each of those and how they relate to the operations of two platforms, TikTok and YouTube, and before moving to some recommendations about how we might study and investigate these systems. So the term surrounds is often used to talk about how screens are arranged and put forward. So the different ways that you're able to interact with a platform and how that promotes and prioritizes certain content over, over others, how much prominence it receives on the screen, what ones come up uh, on the homepage versus down. And so trying to make sense of what are the ways that content is being recommended. Now, this is something that we're working through in Critical to Siskiya Klochek for to this diagram of how we might look at a platform like TikTok and the ways that its organization of screens has different ways of exposing users to content and the consequences of that. So TikTok, for example, has two principal modes of engaging or accessing videos. So one is the For You page, which is a constant stream of algorithmically curated videos that are being recommended. And the second is the Discover page, which is from as far as we know, a combination of human and machine coordination about recommending content. So in one sense, when we're talking about how platforms are engaging or intervening in this question of discoverability, we can see already presently, it's not simply an algorithm, but multiple points of contact that are presenting uh, content and the ways that we might look at the differences between the Discover page and the For You page in the ways that it is uh, expressing or, or publicizing certain types of material and content. 
Well, the second term that we use in, in terms of discovered beliefs, thinking about what are the vectors or the ways that we can interact with humans and machine agencies in, in, in coordinating surrounds and also recommending contents. And so this is often where I'd say a lot of people are focusing about algorithmic recommendations, looking at specifically algorithms that are doing content recommendations on the platform. And in, in a sense that it needs to be understood as situated, that there's different algorithms functioning for different parts of the website that are kind of recommending these contents and these algorithms behave differently. And this we can see actually in Google's own presentations of its research. So here's a timeline of how Google's described its evolution of its algorithmic recommendation. Now it's quite telling because there's notable gaps in the coverage of this. Google re launches its recommendation in two, 2008. It's only in 2011 that, it's, that Google itself claims that it builds classifiers to identify videos that were racy or violent and preventing them from being recommended. So when we're talking about algorithmic recommendation, we're looking at a system that's changed and changed dramatically over the 10 or 15 year period that has become the prominence in our society. And then in the own internal investigations reporting, we can see that there's notable gaps in how these systems have been thought to behave. And so when we start looking at how these algorithmic recommenders work, we might start to begin to then unpack what are the different vectors or different ways that content is being recommended. And so here's a kind of a work in progress, but a way of describing what is that that process of recommendation taking place on platforms. And that this is something that you generic. So it's kind of common in both how TikTok and YouTube would work. And that I'd like to kind of emphasize that there's a few different moments where there's kind of algorithmic influence and that it's important to be attentive to these different systems at play, particularly for the consequences and the ways that they might be kind of gamed. So that most platforms have a what we might call a content universe, which is the variety of videos or content available. And often a recommender is dealing with a sample of that. This is particularly in, in free for a platform like TikTok, there's roughly about 3000 videos that are candidates for recommendation. Then platforms take out of that pool of, of potential videos to recommend using different recommender algorithms that are picking potential candidates to recommend to recommend and that these are different systems at work these are different recommenders similar to how facebook says that they're changing different classifiers you can see that these classifiers or recommenders are picking different videos and that they have different metrics embedded particularly metrics that are also connected with teams that are designing ways of recommending content these recommendations are fed up to a ranker which is then making a decision about what recommendations are more or less important and that finally once there's a ranked list this is then becomes composed and that the screen itself then is the result of a variety of algorithmic processes that are saying well what will be the videos that appear on the right side of a youtube video or what will be the ones that will appear next and so this also then becomes mindful of the way that the website itself is not the product of an algorithm but a variety of interactions between algorithmic systems with different optimization techniques and different way, different points of both being gamed and also logics of the construction of creation. All I say is that this leads to, I think what we want to emphasize is uh, different uh, you know, experiences on the platform and different behaviors that are at least trying to be engendered and supported. So I think what one of the parts we're trying to be mindful of is what are the kind of habits that find and interact with algorithms. And so I always like this example, this comes from the paper Robert and I wrote, about the carousel as a particular algorithmic experience. So this right dates back to this famous scene in the TV show Mad Men, where Don Draper premieres the Kodak carousel as a repetition or loop of familiar or nostalgic images that we might be able to cycle through, which is not unlike the habits that we now have on Instagram, where we have our comfort zone perpetually scrolling through an unending list of content that we find safe and appropriate. And so how do we understand the different ways that algorithmic systems might interact and create other types of experiences, particularly what we've been alluded to a, is the idea of rabbit holing of these ways that cultivating be behaviors to go into kind of more and more deeper directions and to be mindful of where or how there's kind of an interaction between these algorithmic systems and what behaviors are being met. And so what we find in our research is that often what algorithmic systems do is, is actually respond 
and meet a demand. And so principally not trying to problematize that these systems are necessarily causing radicalization or extremism, but they're meeting a pre-existing demand for these types of content, which shifts then the conversation from worrying about algorithms as a driver to algorithms as a, as a kind of means of amplifying or drying up the con or kind of contributing. And so when then how does this make sense of what are potential consequences for algorithmic harms? I think one th theme that we've come up and I particularly like Marion Lim's term algorithmic brokerage is do curious users chance upon disinformation? In my own investigations on TikTok, my casual browsing of convoy led videos led me to being recommended in subsequent days, a stream of, of a largely anti-vax pro-convoy content. And so how might we look at algorithmic harms is not something about a filter bubble, but more specifically about actually amplifying fringe or marginal content. And that might be a transient position as the algorithm changes itself. But then how is it that particularly these systems might be behaving in ways that are unaware of the ways they're recommending or promoting or, or selectively exposing people to content that might be more extreme? The second question then becomes, do recommendations cater to extreme requests? And I think this is a, you know, a specific way of shifting then this idea of, of kind of radicalization to say that algorithms themselves might not be necessarily sophisticated, not sophisticated enough to know the particular context and, and requests being made to them. So that these drives towards more and more extreme content might be as much as your interest in the latest cooking video might simply be uh, might treat that same request or demand as looking for more extreme or right, far right or extreme right content. And so the fact that these systems themselves, as sophisticated as they make them up to be, might be context unaware and relatively like unintelligent in making kind of distinctions between what type of content is being offered up. So if in terms of how do we move forward in trying to think more clearly about these kind of terms of algorithm, uh, algorithmic terms. First recommendation I make is that we need to move towards more situated studies of algorithms and, and AI. And this is something when I use situ the term situated quite deliberately, kind of inspired by my own work and feminist, my own uh, inspired by feminist technology studies, is trying to think of what are the particular contexts which in algorithms work and with this as part of a broader media experience that might then be contributing. And so I'll try to kind of desituate it as a central to a marginal claim. The second question, which alludes to kind of my beginning of talk, there's no media fixes here. There's no way that fixing algorithms is going to do, is going to address the deeper demands. And I think in part, what we need to contend with the desire is feeding, feeding personalization. What are the particular motivations that are, are now being offered up and the ways that kind of uh, a far right or extreme right, the political uh, attitude is then being met by algorithmic systems. And where does that come from? And I think particularly that's a deeper, more vexing question and one that I think requires you know, a, a moving away from some of these questions of say algorithms themselves to looking at what are the kind of deeper structural libidinal desires in Canadian culture that are now being able to be realized and actualized through largely context and aware algorithmic systems. And so with that, I just want to say thanks to everyone here. It's a really fantastic chance to be part of this presentation. And for those who are interested, this work has been supported by the Digital Citizenship Contribution Program from Department of Heritage, uh, and that oh, our research is being posted on the Canadian Disinformation Network. And I want to say thank you to all my co-panelists and also all my team who has been so fantastic and made this project so great. So with that, I'll pass it off and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fenwick. Uh, thank you to all the presenters for uh, providing an amazing and insightful analysis of the ways in which we can begin to look at this phenomena, but also issues around definition, contextualization, and the role of uh, affect as it circulates, as well as how, in fact, you know, something can escalate and amplify um, into a filter bubble or into a, a echo chamber, but also how it moves the discourse along the political spectrum. So now I'd like to ask uh, the audience for any questions and uh, comments that you would like to ask and share. So Ahmed, I'm gonna ask with uh, the question that was already asked, which is how do you manage to do such difficult work, especially when you have to read such horrible texts um, in order to sort of like, you know, 
make sense of how this discourse is operating, but also what it's anchored around. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, it's not really an easy job. And I believe I responded with some details uh, in the uh, comment. It requires some training, I believe so. Um, and uh, like I'm like uh, I'm used to this kind of content uh, from the study of um, from the study of terrorism and uh, uh, violence in the Middle East. So, like I'm not foreign to this kind of content. But I was a bit concerned. I'm still concerned about the other team members. So that's how it all started. The um, the questions were all about: uh, Are you ready? Are you willing to? Um, work with uh, content that is related to hate. And then of course, uh, ongoing follow-up. And uh, it's a huge issue and concern. Uh, like we have a postdoc, for instance, in our uh, team who often gets um, hate messages because of her uh, uh, media appearances uh, in, in relation to the recent protests in Ottawa. And that's concerning. And. Um, so we, I, I need to follow up. And I also get these kinds of messages from time to time. Uh, honestly, the, you know, I, I, I think there is not enough care or let's say follow up by our academic institutions. So we need to, have, to be better protected as, as academics and scholars when it comes to uh, getting such kind of hate messages. I have like I've never thought I should deal with this. I'm, I, we don't get paid for that, uh, but that's the reality today. Uh, when we talked about COVID nineteen, especially COVID nineteen uh, issue, uh, and more recently, of course, the protest. Um, so, like uh, we are a bit uh, like unprotected when it comes to this issue, and it's really concerning. Uh, I might say, yeah, we are strong, but you know, in reality, you, you go back home and you think, yeah, well, th some of them could be threatening. Uh, so uh, it, it, it remains a concerning issue. But thank you, thank you for asking. It just reminds me that the Canadian Journal of Communications has, in fact, an article just on this very thing, which is this kind of sort of precarity that's involved in doing this work and what are institutions, academic institutions doing to protect us. And I know that the, the Canadian Association of Journalists actually did put something out because the journalists were really being harassed um, uh, in covering the, the so-called uh, convoy. So I want to go now to the question that was asked in the chat, which unfortunately I didn't see, but um, thankfully, Zena passed it on to me. Uh, Dr. Lim, this is a question for you. There seemed to be a significant presence of the Christian right in the Canadian convoy. Did you find this in your study? Church groups played a large role in South Korea. Did you find the same in other countries? And what role, if any, did alternative media, example, the Rebel Daily Wire, play? Oh, thank you for, okay. for the question. So yes, absolutely. Christian nationalists uh, is uh, play very big role to all over the place. I think I, I remember I see a sign with from Second Chronicles at the truck, up mm -hmm. one of the trucks in 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 Ottawa, right? So in in South Korea, obviously, because South Korea actually has a historically this the. Uh, historically has this uh, Christian evangelical explosion. And that's a, that's a, that tends to be on the, so evangelical tend to be on the right anyway. But it doesn't mean that it, Christian, Christian conservative, like they play similar role everywhere. So in terms of uh, extreme right slash anti-vaccine mandates all over the world. I think in in the case of Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, historically kind of share the same white nationalism history, and then you have the Christian right Christian conservatism that mingle into politics for decades. So that's the reason why it is become part of that. But also I think, but it's not only Christian. 
If you look at Indonesia, for example, anti-vaccine, there hasn't been like big rally, but disinformation and conspiracy theories around vaccine is actually spread by Islamist uh, nationalists. So Islamist um, right-wing Islamists. The, the case that other like Hindu nationalists in India, why they are not, or Catholic uh, nationalists in Philippines are not, is not because of their belief, because the leader who is embraced by themselves actually roll the vaccine program. So Hindu national, as long as they, they still trust Modi, they will still embrace the vaccine. But now there is a decline trust in him. There might be a growing number of vaccine existency. So in the case of Duterte, Christian rights feel that he is the savior of Christian values, even though he is not, right? Because he is being authoritarian about vaccine, therefore the Christians also are behind the vaccine. So whatever is interesting is, is, is not the action itself, but how they perceive the in and out groups. If the person, the persona being perceived like in Indonesia, the president is Muslim, but he is being perceived as not because he, he, he is pro um, uh, the more sort of like tolerance, pluralism, therefore he is not part of Islamist right. So, so I think this is what is happen what's happening uh, in all over the world, but the role of alternative media, absolutely. The rebel media media is big one, was big one actually cover, cover the, giving the live stream of, of uh, and commentaries. So, and, and also was very active even before, right, in, in, in Canada. Uh, similarly in other places too. So this me alternative media in South Korea, for example, is pretty much like Alec Jones, the alternative media. It's like this uh, and, and giving commentary on various, various uh, random issue and then, and then focus on certain conspiracy theories. So these, is, these are, but beyond that, also there are like less, like less prominent one. So I was, I was doing the same thing like Fenwick, what Fenwick did during the Freedom Convoy and, and just like drifted to this far right that is actually a travel website on, on, on Facebook. It's just showing only uh, as if the police or the police was so harsh and just like violence and and the, the commentary coming from all over the world, especially from New Zealand and Australia, they're uploading Freedom Convoy. And it was actually a travel channel. So I think it's interesting how algorithm actually kind of like expose you to other alternative medias that we're in sort of like expanding the margin. I like that term. Thank you. I hope that answer the questions. Great, thank you. I'm going to um, also uh, direct a question at Dr. Bola, which you've actually answered in your chat, but I think that everybody would actually benefit from this. Um, one might argue that the colonial discursive practices are deeply connected to disinformation, example, scientific racism. What are the risks of studying disinformation ahistorically uh, and uncritically? seems like such an important question and reminds me in fact of what Fenwick in part was just talking about regarding algorithms and how, for example, the news media gives us such a limited understanding of uh, what that is. So the role of, of journalism in terms of representing a concept like disinformation or, um, or post-truth or any of these terms, yes, I mean, we, we're living in a culture where there's a great chance of it being dehistoricized and not understanding the colonial histories of a concept. So um, I'm curious what other folks would say, but I, my response had just included, I, I teach a course on the politics of truth. And that's precisely what I think is so important to get at, that we have this sense that the current context of debates about 
post-truth or fake news, et cetera, that these are, are recent occurrences that hadn't occurred before. But in fact, things like quote unquote post-truth, the idea that emotions rather than facts drive what we believe or what, what we, yeah. Um, I mean, these debates have gone on forever. I mean, that's what the, that's what the uh, scientific revolution was about in part, right? So we're in a very difficult moment of having to balance what has come to be a culture of question, questioning the authority, questioning the authorities, whether that be science or what have you, that, that creates supposed facts, right? We have taught people to have those critical skills, and yet some of that backfires in certain contexts like climate change, right? There's a real um, danger in questioning particular kinds of authority around certain kinds of questions. And yet in other cases, it's so important to, to ask that. So um, I'm, I'm curious what other folks here might have to say about that. I'm sure we have other important points. Well, I know that I was, uh, when uh, Merlina was talking about uh, the Christian group, I was reminded of uh, muscular Christianity as one of the backbones in the whole colonial process here. So there are so many resonances and even um, your own work and Ahmed's work about like uh, the rhetoric of excessiveness, for instance, the affect. Um, that's very much tied to the whole colonial representation of, of uh, minorities, uh, racialized peoples in particular. So there is that element as well. Uh, Zainab has a question that she, I would urge her to ask. <laughs> Uh, the question that I put just, you, you mentioned that, right, Yasmin? Yeah. So could anyone say something about the unique effects of the member of the public of the mere condition of getting information from electronic platforms, which many different co uh, contradictory and unknown sources being come uh, open there? This question is being asked from everyone who can ask, answer. Can you repeat the question, Zainab? It's in the chat. I don't know if you can see it. I could just oh. post it. Okay. It's about the, it's, it's the fact of the affordances in the sense of having access to this information electronically, as opposed to what it was like reading it, um, say for instance, in the newspaper. And I think this very much actually also ties in to uh, some of the work that's been referenced in the CJC around like, what are these imaginative communities that are emerging and how is this information? The fact that it's so liquid, you know, when it comes through the electronic system as opposed to reading it um, on a tangible newspaper uh, is something that I think deserves comment. I, I, you know, I, I will say, uh, if I can jump in, I'll say two comments is mm. that in, in, in one sense, I think it's important to call in the question, you know, as Yasmin, as your work could show another thing, it's just the, the quality of Canadian journalism in, historically hasn't been fantastic and like accessibility. So I think, you know, in one sense, not to, not to celebrate what is, I think, a very deeply problematic history of press coverage and pre press relations, you know, particularly, um, you know, in Canada, and that evidence suggests that social media is actually, and getting your sources online can be really effective in, in getting exposed, what they basically say is exposure diversity and incidental exposure. So finding the news if you're not looking at it. And I think to me, kind of two deeper issues is that we, we live in a kind of mode of, of abundant information in which kind of habits of, of democratic participation are increasingly less and less promoted, right? I mean, if you have an ability of watching Netflix with a constant assumption of consuming content and a culture of overwork, where are the ways that we've kind of created, you know, cultures or, or kind of resources to allow people to feel like they have the time and energy to participate in politics? And certainly, like in a, a generation of kind of a overwork and extractive capitalism, that that's really hard to see how the possibilities that. Um, and then I'd also say that there is something in particular about this consequences of these systems and right wing politics. And the two points I'd make is that it seems like in state studies in the United States and the UK, that there is a subset of right wing voters that that are able to kind of gravitate to, you know, extreme content, or content that's kind of that, that kind of fits into their own political views. 
and, and that's something that is not a general problem. It's a specific problem. And so I think partially why we're here in a panel talking about extreme right and far right is that there's some confluence of media systems and far right politics. And I'd also say that Twitter has released a report that says its own algorithmic recommendation favors right wing sources. Now it's a kind of smaller sample, but it's the first evidence we have that there might be something at work here that says that right wing content, particularly the politics of right wing content with, an out with a sense of outrage might perform better in certain algorithmic systems and that you, uh, right wing users themselves might demand this type of content. So I'd say it's less of a general problem than saying kind of specifically what are the consequences of the, these media systems and changes in media systems to certain right wing mental subjectivities. But that I, I, any uh, that's that's a good explanation. But it brings me back to what what um, without sort of like a sounding like an old fashioned. Uh, although I think I must be at some point um, a thinker, the fact that there is a substratum like this that is now being amplified through these kinds of technologies that has always been amplified, come to think of it. So when we think about, for instance, uh, writing, you know, or even Benedict Anderson's work about imagined communities and the news, he uses the newspaper as that point. Well, who had access to the papers? And like you were saying, historically, journalists have not done a good job because when you think about the reporting on Louis Riel that was there in the major newspapers, uh, clearly, it was not something that was on site. On the other hand, there are affordances in these technologies. The fact that you can, you know, type in something really fast, really quick. The fact that you have these comment sections open, which, you know, is some of the work that I've done and the amount of hatred that's there. It's almost like, and this is what I kind of wanted to say to Ahmed's uh, presentation. It's, it's what I had said like 20, 30 years ago, which is, well, it's as much hate as the market can bear, right? If the market can exploit that hate, it's going to do it. So ultimately it boils down to the system that's fueling and the currency that is actually greasing the entire machine. Tanner has a question um, for Ahmed and um, uh, Tanner, would you like to come on and, and say the question? Oh, sure. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks to everyone for these excellent presentations. Um, I have two questions, um, one related to what to do in response to these platforms and the companies that own them. Um, and the second one is more of a political question for Megan, but I'll, I'll take that one up second. So I think the first one is for Ahmed, but I think it must also be applied to uh, Merlina and Fenwick as well. So Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos once said that it's ugly speech that needs protection. Um, Nonetheless, Amazon recently developed a hate content moderation policy, but it's one that's very ineffective. So Amazon says through its community guidelines um, that it prohibits its vendors from selling, quote, products that promote, incite, or glorify hatred, violence, racial, sexual, or religious intolerance, or promote organizations with such views, end quote. But at the same time, Amazon says its hate content policy applies to vendors who sell, quote, all products except books, music, video, and DVD, end quote. So while the books by Lauren Southern, a white supremacist, and Gavin McInnes, founder of a white nationalist terrorist group, likely meet the criteria of hate speech, because they're books, they're exempted from Amazon's own hate speech content moderation policy. They freely flow as commodities from Amazon markets to millions of consumers all over the world year after year. So as Amazon's own privatized hate content moderation apparatus is ineffective at stemming the flow of this hateful digital disinformation, what alternative opportunities might exist for the researchers, citizens, and activists who want to get Amazon to challenge these far-right propagandists? So what do we do about the free flow of digital book hate propaganda by white supremacists on Amazon if Amazon itself and its own hate content moderation fails um, as it currently does? So that's a question for Ahmed, but, but others as well might jump in. Thanks, uh, Tanner. This is a very tough question, by the way. You gave me the hardest question. It's fine. Uh, so talking about uh, Amazon um, and the discussion about uh, freedom of uh, expression, I find it to be a bit hypocritical when it comes to uh, people talking about freedom of expression, because when they say uh, hate speech should be protected, they usually refer 
to the protection of hate to uh, when it comes to targeting others, not themselves. Uh, so when, uh, for example, they are targeted by hate, they feel very infuriated and uh, angry, and uh, they seem to forget what they've been preaching about. So I see there is some kind of hypocritical uh, viewpoints or uh, position when it comes to hate speech, uh, freedom of expression. So definitely we need to protect freedom of expression, but I am a firm believer that there are limits uh, to uh, uh, freedom of expression uh, because uh, with freedom of expression comes responsibility. And this responsibility may, makes us uh, you know, uh, think hard about uh, protecting others, especially vulnerable groups. So it doesn't mean that you, you have the license to uh, send hate, you still have the responsibility to make sure that uh, you do not oppress others who are vulnerable in the society. Now, going back to Amazon uh, and the way they framed it, I think this is part of their business model. They don't want to lose people. Uh, Lauren Southern uh, brings them a lot of money and her likes. Azra, Azra Lavan, for example, has maybe over eight books on Amazon. They don't want to lose this kind of income. Uh, for uh, Jeff Bezos, he wants to profit in, uh, in as many ways as possible. Uh, so definitely they will find a loophole uh, to promote these ideas. However, I argue that they are promote, they are, they have stopped promoting other things like a t-shirt with a symbol of, for example, hate. Uh, so isn't that written thing? Isn't, I mean, I, I'm like, I will look carefully into this article because it requires some reflection and some investigation on Amazon. But there seems to be some kind of confusing guidelines uh, followed by Amazon, which I think uh, stems from pressure on them. When there is public pressure on Amazon, it suddenly changes. So, and that's something I have also commented on. I think we, we, we have all a responsibility to do something about it, at least talk about it. Even if the, there is no change, it's fine. I mean, the least I can do here and elsewhere is to talk about it. I'm not going out uh, to um, protest in Ottawa about it, uh, but I will, def I will def definitely, no one can shut me up. That's something uh, I'm going to continue doing. I hope I answered your question, Tanner. It was a bit multi-layered. Thanks so much, definitely. It's a complex one and I myself don't have the answer to it, but I'm just putting it out there for you and, and other uh, panelists tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Tanner. Thank you, you also had a question for Megan. Sure. Um, Megan, I, I, I might have mis, misinterpreted part of the presentation on resentment, um, but I'm going to sort of riff on that one with regard to a politics of countering. I think what we see is, is white identity politics um, in, in really absolutist and essentialist ways uh, that are developing uh, right now. So if Wendy Brown is correct and the far right is effective at getting white folks to see themselves as a unique racial cultural identity group that is being victimized, not in old class terms, as Marxists would argue, by capitalism and its ruling strata, but in identity terms, um, by a plurality of other groups that have been racialized as non-white. What strategies and tactics are available for countering the far right's affective identity politics of white resentment? Is there anything being done conceptually, practically, politically to address those feelings and grievances around victimhood among white people, not just to get them to reflect upon their historic and continuing privilege, but to shift that white resentment away from identity groups racialized or other as non-white and toward more of a solidaristic uh, intersectional working class politics that might target the political economy of capital and the class bias outcomes of the system as a whole. I just sort of think, is there like a new intersectional working class politics of resentment that might be effective at disrupting the far right's white identity politics of victimhood and resentment? Are there any cases or examples of this that might be useful models, you know, in terms of digital media strategies or tactics or just organization uh, or, or movement politics today? So that's a bigger political question uh, for Megan, um, but also for others as well. Thank you. Wow, Tanner, you just have the million dollar questions tonight, don't you? 
<laughs> Those are uh, the questions about what what next and what are some solutions to this. So, yeah, as I as I have been rereading, say from Nietzsche thinking about ressentiment to Wendy Brown articulating that in 1989 to this resurgence of interest in in ressentiment. Um, yeah, I mean, Wendy Brown's analysis is the only one of this recent literature I've seen that really talks about a direction and her direction is precisely what you are speaking about. And in fact, she wasn't at that time, right? The, the sort of white victim identity that we've seen this reversal of the use of discourses from the left appropriated by the right, which is part of what we're witnessing right now. That's not what she was talking about. She was talking about the, you know, the identity politics that were just emerging at the time and was really in a way going out on a limb with what was at that time a rather un-PC position in, in some ways, but urging the, the Marxist solution of where has class analysis gone, right? So, I mean, her question is very similar to yours or even her direction. And uh, yeah, I mean, this, this odd affect or this odd feeling came to me as I was reading about the difference between resentment and ressentiment. So resentment is understood as, for example, an, an anger that's directed at a very clear target and that might in fact have, have a solution. One of the challenges with ressentiment is that the identity and affective investment in that um, that there's this transvaluation, that the thing that you once admired and loved has now become the thing you hated. And the identity that you have as a victim um, has, to, has to remain. It's so tied and the, and the, um, the more positive twist on that is so deeply repressed that there's in fact, there's no out to that ressentiment. So as I've been reading about that, I've, I've thought, what would it take to turn ressentiment into resentment? Because resentment, in fact, supposedly has has more of a direct uh, way of responding to it. So, yeah, I, I think others others here might certainly have thoughts about that. Um, uh, Yasmin, some of your work touches on this. Yeah. I think, I think um, Zainab, some of your work. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to say about that, uh, but I'm just going to go back to the chat because there's it's been active. So, uh, uh, Mariam, um, where is she now? Mariam Kareem actually has um, uh, put in a reminder that one way in which we can counter some of this is through the policy vehicle. And there is a call for papers on um, anti-racism in Canadian broadcasting. So she's put a link out there in the chat uh, for those of you that, that want to pursue this. And the second question has also to do with kind of what Tanner raised is the whole notion that can social movements game algorithms in meaningful ways? Do examples such as Twitter swarm strategies by queer groups reappropriating the hashtag proud voice hashtag uh, or activist groups like Google bombing uh, Trump's picture with the word idiot on Google images represent viable political strategy, or are they a stunt type of stunt activism with minimal impact? So that's a question sort of like worth looking at because one is how much of this, because so much of this happens on, in the realm of alternative media, but just as the right, the far right has taken a means as a way to disguise and subversively communicate their messages can you know can we use those tools now to counter these very processes yep, can i uh yes absolutely I mean, it ha historically happened uh is it is all over the world in fact that's precisely one of the main strategy of pro democratic activists in authoritarian countries from hong kong to tunisia uh, so it is possible However, it by itself is not sustainable and it is really costly, right? Like it could be associated with, it's actually 
I mean, people could risk their life doing that, right? The trace is everywhere. But also I think it is ad hoc, a pomerol. It's very hard to maintain and, and it has become increasingly difficult. So in the case of Hong Kong activists, for example, the fact that they keep on trying to hack to gain mainstream media attention, I mean, they have to compete, compete with the news of ISIS that dominate mainstream international media eventually once they tweet is number one in the world, right? By using certain type of algorithm, uh, they, they won. But of course this is out of a lot of attempts, like thousands of attempts, there's a lot of work come into it. Uh, and, and for especially, they too need to simplify their work into something that memeable, hashtagable, right? And probably losing something in the process. I think, I think, I think that's, that is that cost associated with that. And something that is not challenged is structurally the social media algorithm and environment are not created to, to actually side with them. I mean, I sort of, I'm trying to take in, into the question of ugly speech. Yes, all kinds of speeches are protected. The problem is in social media environment, they are not treated as equal. Our problem is not with the fact that, okay, ugly speeches uh, uh, is just, I mean, like if you have ugly speech and I have a long, beautiful speech about humanity, and if I have a chance, to be viral, just like the same, on the same probability with Alex Jones, that would be equally protected. But that's not what happened. Our problem with, 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 is not a, about that. Our problem with the amplification, exponential amplification of extreme content, extreme speech, right? So it, it is actually a flawed argument to use that that argument of this species has to be, is absolutely log logically flawed. And, and the problem with, I think there is a question about whether social media platform are willing to change. Yes, there are changes. YouTube actually had a dozen of changes in algorithm after Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica. So in 2017, however, they try to make up because eventually what they care about is to gain profit, which is to keep user engaged as long as possible on the platform. And apparently, according to their research, the extreme emotion keep them engaged longer. So they, they create algorithm deeper now on the top of algorithm they remove. So I think that's, that's the problem. The problem is the algorithm keep changing. They could fix it. But as on the basic notion of what it means to have minimal communication is not change, we will still have this problem. That's my contribution. Great. Thank you so much. It kind of uh, leaves me in a pessimistic mood <laughs> for the rest of the night, which is like, this is so much about also the market in the sense that how much of this is money, revenue, atten the attention economy and what you can get out of it. And so it's a matter of like, you know, what are the options it, unless one tilts the market or gets rid of it? And that's not going to happen. But anyway, I don't want to leave everybody on a pessimistic note. So I'd like to just turn this around uh, and, and uh, really thank all the panelists that are here. Thank all the partners that have made this possible. A special thanks to Tanner for always being on site. Uh, in so many ways, and to Zainab for pulling all of this together. So thank you all very, very much. And I hope to see everyone again in the next series that is about to happen. When, Zainab? March 17th. March 17th. So thank you all again. And I'll close this meeting. Thank, this thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you all. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Yasmin.